So about 20 years ago, uh, a friend of mine handed me a book, and the book was called Eternal Security. Up to that point, I hadn't even heard of, of such a thing. And to be honest with you, I knew I had asked Jesus into my heart, but uh, I, uh, well, quite frankly, I was scared of Judgment Day. I was terrified of it. I was afraid of uh, being left behind, or, or uh, I would have dreams even about uh, Judgment Day. And, and I remember a dream I had. I sat in a ch- church service. It was the end of the world. And I went and stood in line, and the pastor was handing out these cards as we were leaving. And when I got up to where I got my card, the card said heaven or hell. And people were like being separated like sheep and goats, and some people were heading off to the right, and they were like going up into the clouds through this one door out of the church. And the other people, there was fire coming out of the other door, and they were falling into a pit. And my dream ended with me grabbing that card, and it said hell on it. Um, I was terrified. But then my friend puts this book in, in my hand, and it's called Eternal Security. And I read it, and I was comforted by it. The problem was is I was too comforted by it. Over the, seven, the next seven or eight years, uh, I wasn't following the Lord. But unlike before, I felt extremely secure in my faith, that I once saved, always saved, I, I belonged to Jesus. And I was just comfortable enough not to change anything <laughs> in my life. So the question in this balanced gospel series and these last three uh, messages have been on salvation in particular. The question I want to ask this morning is, should I have been comfortable? As Christians, can we be secure in our salvation and once we are, are, are born again, that, that means once we have crossed from, from uh, death to life, uh, once we have asked Jesus into our heart, can we then cross back from life unto death? Can we lose our salvation after being children of God? We're on the last of five questions regarding God's salvation Remember, each week we've, uh, when we've asked these questions, we've given five different uh, answers uh, to each question. So this week is, can I lose my salvation? And I'm not gonna, this is the order we've been doing it in. I'm going to mix up the order a little bit this morning. But uh, the gist of it is we're going to look at the Calvinist view. We're going to look at the Arminian view of can I lose my salvation. Uh, you're going to look at your pastor's view. My, I will give you my view as well. Uh, then we're going to look at we're going to look at extreme views that as Christians we uh, need to be warned of we need to avoid and then finally we're going to look at what all Christians need to believe in regards to these questions. Um, if if you need a refresher or you missed the the last two messages uh, with the first four questions, I encourage you to go to our website or or even download our app. Our All of our sermons are are on our app, so you can uh, get a refresher on those first four questions because I'm not going to do a review on those this morning. Can a Christian lose his or her salvation? I'm going to start off with the extreme dangers uh, when it comes to this question. First of all, an extreme danger is a works-based approach to uh, salvation. thinking that our sin can still separate us from God after we come to Christ. We know that before Jesus, the reason we needed a Savior is because our sin separated us from God. We need a Savior to reconcile us and to bring us into relationship with God. It's a dangerous point of view to think that after you come to Christ, that your sin can still separate you from God, That was the whole point in him bringing you, uh, him dying on the cross in the first place. So that's a, a dangerous point of view to have. Uh, so the idea here would be that if, uh, if I sinned, if I, if I lost my temper, and then somehow I had a heart attack or whatnot, that um, I would go to hell because I'd sinned right before I died. Actually, this applies uh, to clear up a lot of confusion, uh, some confusion, uh, to suicide. Uh, 
a lot of people, a lot of people's questions are, are, are because some of the, I think some uh, branches of Pentecostalism and, and some uh, Catholicism believe that if, if, if you uh, commit suicide, you're, you're headed straight for hell. Uh, and that's simply not true. It doesn't mean you're headed to heaven either. I mean, a lot of times, you know, people, when they commit suicide, it may be because they have a, a hole in their heart that needed to be filled by Christ, and they never received, uh, received Christ. But there's also uh, um, there's temporary insanity. Sometimes we get depressed, and we feel, although we have overall hope, we had a moment of, of hopelessness. There's mental, um, there's mental issues sometimes, chemical issues uh, that we're not aware of that's going on in, in, in people's lives. So just because somebody commits a suicide, to say that somebody committing suicide means that they, uh, they're on an automatic path to hell is saying that our sin still stands between us and God. Because that's the idea there. You committed the most atrocious sin, so you must be headed to hell. Uh, another danger is thinking that, uh, that Christians can become sinless in this life. I mean, there are some that think that we can uh, reach a form of, of, of perfectionism where we no longer uh, sin in this life. That's a, a dangerous uh, doctrine that we need to avoid. The truth is, is that we are saved by grace, all right? When we come to Jesus, it is by grace, and then we are what's called sanctified by grace, uh, God working out the sin in our lives as we live for Jesus is also by His grace. It is not of us. Another uh, uh, thing that we need to avoid is what's called easy believism. Easy believism. Uh, I would say a lot of Christians have a, a view of easy uh, believism. It's a dangerous misunderstanding of biblical truths. It's a, it's a form of, uh, if, if some of you that have been uh, in church for a while, maybe you've heard of Once Saved, Always Saved, or um, Eternal Security, like the book. And by the way, that book, there's nothing against the book that I read. It was the way that I had interpreted it at the time, the way I had, I had uh, uh, taken it. But uh, an abuse of the idea of once saved, always saved. And they get it from passages like this, John 10, 27 through 29. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. Now, it's important to understand as we're going through these scriptures, this is the word of God, so I'm not presenting like this scripture right here saying that I reject <laughs> this scripture. If I rejected the scripture, you all are welcome to get up and, and, and leave. This is all the word of God. It's, it, it's ta- oh, I thought Doug was leaving. <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> but it's important, and, and hopefully this morning, with the, with the help of God's grace, I'll be able to give us some context with these scriptures this morning. John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So this is eternal security, once saved, always saved, that when we come to God, that no one can snatch us out of the hands of God. 2 Corinthians 1, 22, Paul says, God has also put his, his, his seal, like his stamp on us, and given us his spirit, in our hearts as a guarantee. It's like when, 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 uh, when we received the Holy Spirit, uh, we were given a stamp by God saying, this is your guarantee that, uh, that you will be saved in the end. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, Paul says, In Jesus you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That same idea is there. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. So when these passages are, are uh, abused, it ends up working like this. When we teach once saved, always saved, or, or eternal security without giving it its proper context, 
we give people a, a, a false security uh, when they do not need a false security. It's a say a, a prayer, repeat after me. Uh, uh, people get, get baptized and, and then there's, there's no seeking after God, no desire for God, no evidence of their faith. And they find themselves uh, out of church, out of fellowship, and 10 years down the road, they're still uh, secure in their faith because they said a prayer and they received Christ. They had their conversion experience. So me, as an under-shepherd under Christ, I have to be very, very careful in the way I present the gospel and the way I continue to present the gospel uh, to you guys as a shepherd over your souls. So hopefully I can give this a little bit of context as we go. The Arminian view. The Arminian view, in both the Arminian and the Calvinist view, uh, use Scripture to support uh, these ideas. Uh, they believe that you can fall away. Once you come to Christ, once you come to Jesus, it is possible to fall away. Not, not because... Um, you committed a sin today, and you can fall away in that regard, but because of, of faith. If you reject the faith, if you reject Jesus along the way, then you can lose your salvation. You can fall away. Hebrews talks a lot about this falling away. Hebrews 10, verses 26 through 27. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, is, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. So again, the Arminians aren't saying that you can uh, uh, sin your way um, into hell, but you can sin uh, your way into unbelief. Actually, we'll see that more in the second Hebrews passage that we'll share. But the key here is if we go on sinning deliberately, we say we receive Christ, but yet we go on sinning deliberately. We have no desire, not perfectionism, but we have no desire to follow, follow Him. We, we continue in our sin deliberately. Hebrews 3, 12-14, Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So sin can cause us to be hardened, and then when we're hardened, that can cause us, that can lead to unbelief, where we stop trusting in, in, in Christ alone. James 5, 19 through 20, my brothers, if any of you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So the idea here is somebody has wandered away from the truth, not just somebody who stopped coming to church is off on their own. Somebody has wandered away from the faith and James says that if you bring them back, God has used you as a tool to save them from death, to save them from, from hell. You have brought them back into the fold, and that covers a multitude of sins. Finally, Revelation 2.10 to the church of, of Smyrna, Paul, uh, not Paul, Jesus, John, the hand of John, but Jesus says to this church, uh, do not fear what you are about to suffer, church. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So the Arminian says we need to, to, we need to persevere. We need to keep the faith. It's not a, a one-time event. It's something that happens throughout the Christian life. So what do the Calvinists believe? Calvinists hold what's called perseverance of the saints. It sounds a lot like what the Armenians believe because uh, 
we, we heard a lot about persevering in faith lest we, lest we fall away. Calvinists define it uh, a little bit different. They defined it as, as God in his sovereignty and the idea of not being able to, uh, that no one can snatch you out of the hands of Jesus once you come to Christ, that God keeps us in the faith from beginning to end. So he keeps our faith and he will cause us to persevere until the end. Philippians 1.6, Paul says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? When you accepted Jesus into your heart, that God began a good work in you. And, and, and Paul tells the church, I am confident of this church that, that God, He who began a good work in you, He's going to see it through. No matter what you may be going through right now, God is going to finish what He started, and you can be secure in that. Jude, uh, Jude 1.24, Jude says, Now to Him, God, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. So he's saying that, that God is able to uh, keep us from stumbling. Now, first of all, God does have the power to keep us from stumbling at all, from ever sinning. Uh, I don't believe in a, in a perfectionism like, like, I mean, like some very, it's minority, but uh, God is able to keep, the Holy Spirit within us is able to keep us sinless. The problem is, is we choose to walk in the flesh. As long as we're walking in the Spirit, we will never fall. We will never, never stumble. God has that power to do that. But a lot of times, we, what do we do? We, we choose to walk in our own flesh, in our own sin nature, and that's why we stumble. But then also, God is able, if we belong to Him, Calvinist says that He is able to keep you from, from stumbling, in other words, falling, uh, falling away. God is able to keep you in Him. 1 Peter 1.5, by God's power... We are being guarded through faith for a salvation that is to be revealed in the last time. So God's power is the one that is guarding us and keeping us in the faith until Jesus returns. And in Philippians 3.12, Paul says, Not that I have already obtained this. He's talking about the resurrection of, of the dead. He's talking about racing. That's, that's his goal. Is, is the resurrection of the dead, the finish, the finish line when he, uh, when he uh, either dies and goes to be with the Lord or when Jesus returns. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. So he's striving after this. He is actively running towards this finish line. I press on to make it my own because why? Because Jesus has made me his own. So he's saying I can press on towards the goal, because Jesus has already made me His, and it's the power of Christ working within me. So that's the Calvinist view. My view, I believe in the perseverance of the saints. I hold, uh, I hold to the Calvinist uh, uh, perspective. I... I believe that through uh, prevenient grace, through the preaching of the gospel, through the Holy Spirit working in our lives, He enables us to, to, to believe or to reject Christ. And once we believe, it's like us saying, um, not my will, Lord, but Your will. And He gives us the Holy Spirit, and I believe that God has promised that those who belong to Him, He will cause them to persevere to the end. What's going on in life is there is a lower story and there is an upper story going on. And I believe that's the way you reconcile these, uh, these different passages in Scripture. Our lower story, that's, that's our life here on earth. All right, And we are called to persevere in the faith. We are called to keep, keep trusting and keep looking to Jesus no matter what. The upper story that's going on is God says, I chose you. And I will cause you to persevere to the end. You are my child. You belong to me. And I will make sure you make it into the end. Perseverance of the saints. Philippians 2.12 Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, Paul says to the church, so now, 
not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. You see that? There's a lower story and there's an upper story. The lower story is work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The upper story is, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Amen. What does that mean? That means that we can be secure in God as long as we are working out our faith. As long as we are working out our faith. Not in anxiety. I don't believe the fear and trembling doesn't mean constantly being being anxious, but being sober in our faith, being real in our faith, being serious about our faith, not taking our faith lightly like I did after I read that book. It's like, all right, I got my, I got my, uh, hell, my fire insurance. I'm good. And I was no longer walking in sobriety. I wasn't taking my faith seriously. I got my stamp of approval, and I didn't follow God after that. Take our faith seriously. 2 Corinthians 13.5 Paul says to this to the church, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? See, he was confident. He, 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 the, the church that he was, he was a shepherd over, he was confident that, that Jesus Christ is in you. But then he says, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Does your life testify. Ask yourselves this. Examine yourselves like Paul says, does your life testify to the presence of the Holy Spirit within you? Can you testify to that? Do you have a desire for the the great commandment and the great commission that we talk about every uh, Sunday morning? Do you have a desire to be in the community of God, to be around God's people? Do you like Christians? (laughs) Sometimes we don't like all Christians, but overall, do you like Christians? Do you be, like being in the company of God's children? Do you have any desire at all for God's Word? I know we, we, we struggle to read the Bible. Do you fight to, to, to eat God's bread? <laughs> do you fight for prayer? I know our flesh side doesn't want to pray. Do you fight to pray? Are you in a relationship with God? Are you talking to God at all? I'm not talking about a works-based salvation. This is a faith-based salvation. Are you walking in active faith? Are you trying, are you looking to be a living sacrifice to God? Or have you got your fire insurance and you just want to know when it comes to sin, will that send me to hell? Can I do it or not? Just let me know. If, if it's going to send me to hell, then I guess I'll have to stop. Or do you want to live for God? Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. And you can be secure. I have been secure. I have not doubted my salvation since 2004. And in 2004, I should have doubted my salvation because I was not living for Christ. I was not walking in the faith. If you don't believe me, look at God's Word. It says if you're not living for Christ, you should test yourself. You should examine yourself. We all should. But God's Spirit will speak to you. I'm telling you, I've been secure since 2004. That's not a holier-than-thou statement. I have had many, many lows. I've been weeping before God many, many times. I've been asking why God many, many times. But I've walked secure in my faith. You can too. But if you're apathetic towards God, you should be questioning your salvation. You should be testing yourself. Like Paul said, don't you know that Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test. All Christians, all Christians, Word of God, very clear, need to believe this. All these passages, Arminian, Calvinism, they're all reconciled to one another. We need to understand that faith is not a one-time act. It's not a magic formula that we say on a Sunday morning during an altar call. It's not a, a, I'm going to get baptized and then I'm going to be good. It has a beginning. Yes, it, it has a beginning. Some people don't realize it has a beginning. They think they were born Christians. It doesn't happen. 
It has a beginning where we were transferred from death to life when we repented of our sin and placed our faith in Jesus alone by the grace of God. And then it perseveres. <laughs> faith keeps going, keeps going. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's as small as a mustard seed. Sometimes you're barely holding on. <laughs> but you know what gets you through? You know what gets you through? The, Jesus said, no one can snatch them out of my hand. He will bring us out of it. He will bring us out of it. But it's our job to work out our salvation in sobriety, in fear and trembling. Mark 4, uh, I don't have the passage up here, Mark 4, 30-32, Jesus says, He says, what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? He said, it's like a grain of mustard seed, speaking of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground, it is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Now, in one sense, he's talking about the beginning of the gospel. Jesus came, <laughs> started with one man, spread to 12 disciples, and soon enough took over the world. There's also an element, too, the, the way that the, the, um, uh, salvation works in us. When we first come to Christ, did you know a lot of animal uh, embryos? Is that the word? Embryo? Uh, fetus? Like, huh? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Well, in the, ba in, in the womb. Yeah, embryo, right? Okay. Embryo. All right. <laughs> that's, that's your the context. Okay. So, a lot of animal, and I'm about to speak about something, I don't even know what the, t the proper term is. <laughs> An animal embryo looks a lot like a human embryo, but as they grow up, they look completely different. So it is with, with the Christian. When we're born again, you know, a lot of times, and a lot of times it's churched people, it's Christian people that make the mistake of somebody got born again and you expect them to be like walking like they've been walking with Christ for 20 years. And it doesn't work like that. In the beginning, they look a lot like that animal embryo. But as they grow and they flourish, they change from a mustard seed and they begin to, to sprout and produce fruit and they become, become something Beautiful. That's what God is doing in us as He causes us to persevere. But that growth often isn't smooth sailing. And I love this little simple illustration here. We like to look at life, our, our life with God is, is plan A. This plan up here is this straight line. But often God's God's plan is, is hills and valleys and storms and rocks and, and bridges and whatever else. I mean, it, it, we, we have times where we're, we're on a spiritual high and sometimes we're at our lowest point. And that's, that's the way it is in Scripture. When you read the Bible, when you read the stories in the Bible, it's not that straight line. It's hills and valleys that these saints had to go through and they were called time and time again. The author of Hebrews says, persevere. Don't fall away. Keep trusting. Keep looking to Jesus. That's why Paul says, keep running the race. I mean, if it was just like fire insurance and then we're good, none of that stuff would be said. All the churches in the book of Revelation are told to persevere. Keep the faith, and I will give you the crown of life. Your reward is coming, but hold on. Hold on. When we persevere in active faith, that is obeying the great commandment and the great commission, loving God, loving our neighbor, fulfilling the great commission, we desire others to come uh, to Jesus because we know how much He loved us and what He saved us from, that it causes us to love other people. When we do this, when we persevere in active faith, our lives testify to the power of something greater than ourselves working within us. It really is a miracle. It is a miracle. When you're going through trials and tribulation and you are trusting God through that and you're working through it in faith, people see that and they see something supernatural that's not of you working within you. And it testifies to the power of Jesus Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit. 
Charles Spurgeon said, if there is one doctrine I have preached more than any other, it is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints even to the end. Why would he say that? Why do you think that the Charles Spurgeon, more than any other doctrine, he preached the perseverance of the saints? It's because the gospel isn't just needed in the beginning. When Paul preached the gospel to the Romans, he was speaking to a bunch of Christians. Did you know, hopefully, when I stand up here each week, I am preaching the gospel to you. When we're sitting in house church and we're discussing God's Word, we are discussing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not, what, it's not just what brings new life to us. It's what sustains life in us. Did you know that? We need the gospel. Christians need the gospel continually. We need that daily bread, that daily source. So that's why Charles Spurgeon preached that more than any uh, other doctrine because life is real the world is real sin is real satan is real and he's out to destroy the believer he's out to destroy the church he's out to cause division in the church he's out to keep you from obeying the great commission he's out to stop you from being on mission and living for god he is out to stop it and so charles spurgeon preached the perseverance of the saints to keep us in christ to keep us persevering to keep us pressing forward, to keep us running the race. It's needed every step of the way to carry us through. So before we, we close, first a warning to the comfortable. You say, I've attended church all my life. I've been baptized. I'm secure. Once saved, always saved. Hey, this is the same place. The question is, is, have you gone on sinning deliberately? That's what the Bible says. Have you continued in your sin? Have you just let your sin lay by the wayside because you've got Jesus? Are you pressing on? Have you examined yourself? Do you work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Because I'm warning you, if you continue down the path you're going, just apathetic, you don't care, you're bored with this whole Christian thing. The Bible says that there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, only a fearful expectation of judgment. If that makes you angry, I don't know what else to do. That's what the Bible says. Do I believe in once saved, always saved? Yes, I do. But we need to test ourselves to see if we're in the faith. You say you have no desire to glorify God in, 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 in all your ways. No desire to be a living sacrifice. No desire to be on mission for Christ. But at least I've got the Lord. You say my life is still all about me. And you know what? I'm okay with that. It's a dangerous place to be. Comfortable and content without any warrant to be so. But then I want to give a word of comfort to those who are anxious. You say, I, I, I love God, but I, I just keep disappointing Him. I keep letting Him down. The things that, that I don't want to do, I end up doing. And the things I don't want to do is what I end up doing. You say, I've messed up bad. I mean, you, Scott, if you only knew what, what I have done in the level of my sin, that I have screwed up royally. You think, God will never accept me. How could He? I feel like a hypocrite. You say, Scott, my life, just like you said, my life is still all about me. It's all about me. But I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that. My word to you is, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Jesus has the power to sustain you to the end, guiltless, guiltless in the day of judgment. So you don't have to be like me having these crazy dreams and being fearful of judgment. If you're a Christian, you should not be fearful of the judgment. When we sing, even so come, 
Lord Jesus come, the Bible ends with a yearning call. (laughs) It should bring a smile to your face. It should bring joy to say, Jesus, Lord Jesus, come. I I, I wait for your appearing. That's the way the the saints of old were. That's the way we should be yearning for Jesus' return. The only thing that should keep us from wanting Jesus to return is because there are souls out there that still need Jesus Christ. You should be exuberant about the return of Christ. My word to you, if you have this unnecessary anxiety, is to press on. Make it your own. If you love Jesus, the Holy Spirit testifies with your spirit. And you know if you love Jesus. You know if you love Jesus. Press on and make it your own because Paul says because Jesus Christ has made you His own. Spurgeon says by perseverance, the snail reached the ark. We'll hang on to that. Doug, come on out, let's pray.